Thanks very much. And, and uh, I think this will follow well, but with some different perspectives to complement the previous two uh, uh, excellent presentations. Um, this is a slightly, the title that you gave was pretty big. Um, so I tried to um, think about the different crisis contexts and it, it was uh, actually quite an, a good exercise. <laughs> um, I thought I would start by thinking about the, the different kinds of crises. Um, we've had a number of them and, and uh, we have, and I believe the last decade uh, had more uh, the speed of crises, the recurrence of crises and the combination of crises have been um, increasing uh, in the pace when it's been looked at historically for different reasons, population, climate change, uh, conflict, and a number of other ones. Uh, there's different kinds of crisis, as you all know, outbreaks, natural disasters, conflicts, and other human-made confidence crises, as well as crises. Um, there are complex multiple crises, and we've certainly seen this in the context of COVID. It's really been a multiplicity of knock-on effects, um, and it's really uh, amplified weak spots in the system, as well as uh, made it difficult for, for instance, uh, social distancing in refugee camps and, and certain of the measures that, you know, are the, uh, the best we have without the vaccine and, and treatments are not feasible in a number of settings, which make it even more of a challenge. And each has different implications. Um, just uh, you, you've seen a number of them, but the we at the Vaccine Confidence Project, when I think back in the 10 years that we've been um, working and we look at confidence in vaccines, confidence in the providers and recognize that confidence as was clearly outlined um, uh, in, in Margaret's presentation, the, um, the, uh, uh, the multiple, the trust in network, the confidence in the system and, and how that affects it. Um, We've done, we've been working, we worked a lot on the Zika uh, outbreak and, and how that was being handled on Ebola, on COVID. And actually right now, we've been, a, a lot of the work we're doing around the Ebola vaccine uh, in about five countries in Africa right now have had to be adapted because of, of COVID. Uh, some of the research we've been doing um, in Brazil had to, and the qualitative research because we couldn't continue with our face-to-face -face interviews at a community level, we had to figure out other ways that we could gather the data in the context of COVID. So COVID is also affecting different ways that we can do what we would normally do in uh, stable times. Uh, this is just news today, actually, from uh, the Independent in the, here in the UK. Um, and, and now we have this additional factor of vaccines starting to actually roll out. Um, as Dr. Kirk said, it's, you know, it's one thing to think about the theoretical uh, notion of accepting a vaccine, but when a push comes to shove, we're really going to know when the vaccine is there. Uh, but in the meanwhile, on the one hand, you might have anxieties about the vaccine. On the other hand, you might feel like you're last in line, you're never going to get it, and you'd really like it or want it or need it. Um, and that's also going to be a challenge. And, and COVAX, for instance, is looking at 20% um, of population. So there's, which had a rational um, reasoning for it, but in the minds of the of people, certainly in what we've heard in Africa, that's an anxiety. Um, background crises matter. Uh, they frame public trust. So one thing we've really learned in the multiple crises we've uh, been working in and around um, is that um, What's happened, the historical context, the setting, the, the risk situation, the, the, confid the, the regular confidence in public, uh, in, um, across the public, does weigh into how people manage cri new crises when they erupt. Um, for instance, um, here in the Philippines, the Dengvaxia, uh, the, the reported risk of a, of a Dengvaxia uh, vaccine became a political uh, drama and is still having knock-on effects in the Philippines. And that same risk 
And that was partly because it was launched in the context of, a, of an election and it became a legacy for one government. But when the risk was announced in under another, it, you know, it became a, a, a different complex situation. Whereas in Brazil, it didn't have the same, the same news for the out for the program didn't have the same kind of effect. So each setting, and we've seen that in a number of different situations, the HPV vaccine, this is the other picture in certain countries in the UK and Scotland, it's gone quite well in Rwanda, it's gone very well, but in certain settings, um, it's created a anxiety, panic, and a, a whole mix of unusual uh, symptoms, which are now being um, uh, named, and there's actually guidance, a new guidance from WHO on immunization stress-related reactions. Well, background stress is a huge factor. These girls um, have had, were having their, their reactions. Only, it only happened primarily in one area of Colombia that had a history of violence, a history of sexual abuse. So background crises weigh in to people's uh, stability and their emotional and both as individuals and as communities. And when we think about rolling out new COVID vaccines, which we're, we're in baby steps with that, it's, uh, we've got a, a long year ahead with multiple vaccine candidates uh, in, will increasingly become available, different efficacy, different safety profiles, probably different doses, different uh, requirements. Um, it's going to be, a, a, we've got a lot of work ahead. So we should anticipate and do some mapping about what are the settings that we're going in, because there are some that we already know are going to take more work and need more special care in terms of trust and confidence building. Um, as we saw in the Philippines, um, the blue line was um, in November before the, uh, ding, uh, the after which was the risk was announced. After that, um, we saw that uh, there was a, a drop, a significant drop in public confidence uh, in the importance, safety, effectiveness, and religious beliefs. But what this slide also shows is that once there was a trust building, a concerted trust building effort, and what was interesting and really consistent with the previous presentation is that the health authorities I think very smartly, didn't make their trust building efforts to try to build trust in the dengue vaccine. They wanted to build, rebuild confidence and trust in the health authority because what had broken was the public trust, confidence and trust in the health authorities. To the extent that they were even hesitant, some parents were hesitant to take deworming medicines that the health authorities were giving in the schools hesitant in some cases about measles vaccine. Um, and it was just, it was about the relationship. It was about the underlying trust relationship. But when they did that effort, they did slowly rebuild. And um, this was using our vaccine confidence index, which they was helpful to them to see um, one, what a drop of confidence there was because we had a baseline confidence index before the risk was reported, but also helped them see that incrementally the efforts they were making were increasing confidence and it kept them motivated in the work. Uh, this was what happened in, in Colombia um, after, uh, after the big scare, which is a different kind of confidence crisis. Um, the uh, vaccine acceptance dropped from 88% to 5%. And um, over a few years there, and it really reduced the optimization and, and the effectiveness of these vaccines. So background confidence really matters. Um, and we also know from our uh, decade of work measuring vaccine confidence and developing our global uh, index that gives us a benchmark and, and consistent metrics to compare against um, is that confidence um, has been an issue in a number of countries, but can change. Um, and also the difference between it's much, people have far more, a lot of confidence actually in the importance of vaccines. Where the numbers drop is when you say, do you have confidence in the safety? Do you think they're safe? And that's where we've got 
and, and we should anticipate the amount of work we're going to have moving forward on building confidence in a very, uh, in a relatively un a limited amount of information moving forward with these different vaccine candidates. I should say on that point, though, um, one of the circulating, frequently circulating um, uh, views that we're hearing in our global social media monitoring is this issue about the, the vaccines, the COVID vaccines being built, developed too fast. They haven't had a, a long enough time to be tested. And I'm going to wait for the next, somebody else to take it before I'm willing to take it. Well, I think we should come back with the statement that, well, actually, over hundreds of thousands of people in trials around the world have taken this vaccine. You're not the first in line. You're the first among the early ones publicly, but we need to remind the public that literally hundreds of thousands of people around the world across the different vaccine candidates have been taking these vaccines in trials. And it's because of them that there's enough confidence that uh, and in the safety and, and the um, effectiveness of these vaccines, or at least the ones that have been approved so far. Um, a couple months ago, we published a, 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 a reflection of the vaccine confidence index data from 2015. This is to 2018, but there's also, for some countries, we have additional countries where we had up to 2019 in the study. Um, and what this map shows, and this is specific to the confidence and safety, there are maps on effectiveness and importance. But what we see here is that uh, confidence is really volatile. In some countries, it's going up. In some countries, it's going down. And what's going on there? Because this, is, this gives a nationally representative sample, but that also flags where we then go in and do local qualitative research more in-depth social media monitoring and try to take it down to a much more local level. But this gives the kind of overview. Um, and in 2015, we flagged that Europe um, was the most skeptical in, in the global study um, with pockets. And certainly if you disaggregated the US into the state level, you would probably see a map a little more similar to Europe because some places would be equivalent. But again, these are nationally representative samples. But you can see that in reaction uh, to um, the uh, this finding, and also it was in reaction to the, the uh, huge measles outbreaks, there, there has been in the last particularly five uh, years, a lot of extra effort across the EU. I know WHO Euro has done a lot in this area and individual countries have said, well, we need to really take some action here. And you can see that it's getting uh, lighter. Uh, the reds are, are fading, which is a sign that they're getting um, more confident. On the other hand, uh, France, which has had the worst lowest confidence in the world, and that's consistent not with just our studies, but others, what we're seeing is that in Francophone Africa, confidence is really waning. And that's one of the issues that we're seeing and starting to map more uh, globally is with language diasporas are uh, sentiment diasporas. We're also seeing that um, there's a lot of attention to Russian bots going into different uh, other states to interrupt. But actually what we're seeing is that in our analysis of VK, which is the Russian monitoring, we see in the Russian language diasporas, the negative sentiments are coming more from outside, from diaspora communities into uh, Russia, and we've seen that with other settings. So a lot of this language diasporas trans, uh, are really transnational and go across community and are highly influential. Um, this is just to our study. There's, um, I, um, uh, Lisa showed the, the Ipsos one and a number of them had had a different mix of countries than this one, um, but, uh, there is there has been quite a bit of really good surveying going on and, and we looked at all of it, but just to show, I guess the, the main point here is that um, in this willingness to take a COVID vaccine, this is not unlike um, some of the, not for everything, but 
Uh, France, for instance, is similarly at the low end of confidence for the COVID vaccine as for COVID vaccine, as for vaccination more broadly. So some of this pattern of willingness is not dissimilar from the background levels of vaccine confidence. Not for everyone, because for some people, COVID has additional factors that they are influencing them. Um, uh, multiple issues will affect public confidence and willingness to take a vaccine, uh, particularly in a context of crisis. One of the things we're really seeing uh, around COVID in some settings is a kind of denialism that COVID is even real or that it's, um, you know, is what, uh, that it that has symptoms that could be so many other things, that it's made up to sell um, more vaccines or that it, it just doesn't, they don't want to believe it. Um, and it just reminded me of, uh, I worked uh, on AIDS for a, a decade and uh, this was one of the early posters, this kind of denialism. Um, and we've also in our Ebola work, we saw it clearly um, around Ebola. Uh, there was a lot of denialism. This is only something that happens in remote areas of of uh, DR Congo, we don't have it in urban areas. This couldn't be Ebola here in West Africa. Um, and I just changed the names there. And, and what was what struck me is, you know, there's some anxiety here in Europe. Some people are saying, oh, this is gonna disrupt Christmas. My goodness, uh, I remember seeing a sign across the, the beach area in Sierra Leone where, which is usually a huge gathering place for uh, Christmas markets, gatherings, festivities. And there was a big sign that said Christmas is canceled. Think back to January, China and, and um, others had to cancel basically their new year. Um, this is not where uh, everybody around the world has had to do things differently um, in the context of these crises uh, to be a, to stay alive, to enjoy them moving forward. This denialism is not just about uh, publics, dissenting publics. We have uh, politicians uh, who are also denying it and are taking a, a big toll. This is Bolsonaro, but we, uh, the US has also had challenges with denialism that um, from the highest levels that this is not as bad as uh, it really is. And that's partly coming from people um, and their the conflicting demands of trying to keep economies, trying not to frighten people, um, different things. Another issue is all the uncertainty and the rumors. It's a very difficult environment. Um, you know, rumors absolutely thrive in situations of uncertainty, but it also means we have to be hugely careful in this whole area of of uh, misinformation and deleting misinformation, because there's a, in times of uncertainty, particularly with emerging and new diseases, you have to be extremely careful to not delete things that may be cues to the character of the virus, that might be cues to issues with a vaccine, um, uh, area, flag new uh, outbreaks. I know WHO in the basement of the headquarters has a uh, um, uh, smallpox uh, rumor archives, because it was hugely important to be listening to any little rumor, uh, especially towards the end of eradication. So we have to be careful. This is um, one of the rumors that we've seen circulating, particularly with uh, one of the vaccine candidates. This is a rumor, do not believe what is under this uh, title here. Um, We've seen a whole mix of where we follow uh, social media globally in a hundred different languages, as well as our survey work. And um, this, one of the challenges is that a lot of these um, misinformation don't have overt uh, fake news as they call it, but provoke questions, provoke thinking, and you can't delete doubt. You can't, uh, it's, that's a, that's a difficult thing for, you can't as a fact checker say, well, you know, delete that. You can delete it for its potential harm. And that's what increasingly, for instance, in our work with some of the social media platforms, looking at different kinds of criteria, that's not just 
uh, deleting misinformation, but really looking with a new lens that implications for harm. Uh, one of the other big circulating misinformation pieces is about the mRNA vaccine um, and people's concerns that it's gonna alter their DNA. And um, what was interesting, we did a study uh, I get a lot of questions. Well, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but it's really an access issue. But does this misinformation really have an impact on people's in intent to vaccinate? So we did a control trial with um, 8,000 people, 4,000 in the US, 4,000 in the UK. We're going to be doing this in multiple other countries around the world, uh, interviewing all of them about their COVID experiences, within which we ask, are they willing to take a vaccine once proven effective and safe? Um, and then we expose a thousand in each setting to fact, factful information about the vaccines. And 3000 people are exposed to the top five circulating pieces of misinformation. Well, what we found in the UK, 54% said they would take a vaccine before being exposed. And that dropped 6.4%. Uh, points uh, down to 47. And in the US, it was less of a drop, but the baseline was lower. Why does this matter? 2.4% points, that's not much of a problem. Well, it is a problem when, when you look across all of these willingness to accept a vaccine surveys, we're hovering around the optimal herd immunity line. So even a few points can knock us down below. This is, um, you know, theoretical intentions to take a vaccine, of course, but they are indicative of where people's sentiments are. Uh, we've seen the impact of these uh, rumors, misinformation in a number of settings around in the very early phases, the phase one trials around uh, Ebola vaccine in Ghana, there was a lot of anxieties. People heard a piece of information that maybe there was gonna be an Ebola trial. Why in Ghana? There's no Ebola here. That means they're gonna bring Ebola here. Um, a, a lot of mixtures and a lot of confusing um, issues. We were doing a lot of person-to-person um, uh, -person interviews with the different sides to create a, a training video that's used at the School of Medicine there now. Um, but uh, we also did a lot of media monitoring to look at who were the players, what were the issues, how they changed over the time. Why do we do this? Well, it's a way for people to see how what can be the trajectory of rumors and their impacts. So it can help uh, healthcare professionals and others um, in, the, in the system to anticipate what could happen so they can be better prepared to look for it. Um, our uh, multi-country study uh, and work around community engagement and, and identification, I won't go into details because my uh, colleague uh, Robert Kanwagi will be talking more about this, but the, the big uh, Ebola, multi-country Ebola initiative called EBODAC is really to support the deployment acceptance and compliance of the Ebola vaccination. And why is this relevant to COVID? It's relevant because the um, uh, COVID vaccine is also two doses. And that's gonna be another complexity that we need to take it. How do you get people back for their second dose? How do you make sure it's the same person? And that's one of the, a lot of the things we've really worked to refine that um, and had I was part of a working group with the uh, for the FDA on um, medical, um, uh, basically looking at different preparedness and communication for a crisis. Um, and we kind of coincidentally, it's really was coincident. We've been suspected that we knew this was coming. We made up this fake uh, name of a SPARS pandemic, which we thought we would think of the example of maybe it could be a Corona uh, vaccine. This is a scenario planning we did. And actually there's so many things relevant. And we did this in 2017. Uh, it was led by uh, Hopkins Center for uh, Health Security. And I was part of the, the, uh, the expert committee as they called it, brought together. But we really, the kind of dilemmas and communication issues that we uh, came up with in this scenario planning are totally relevant to now. And I, I'm, I'm 
been in touch with them about reviving some of these issues because some of the points that we came up with in the report were things to think about. Authorities putting themselves in the place of outraged groups about maybe not getting a vaccine or not getting their services. How can authorities adapt their message? How to balance the scientific explanations for an allocation framework with the humanistic understanding of people's distress? Um, how to set public expectations, the nature of the outbreak, the, the potential supply, the new knowledge, new risks, strategies to address the outrage of lower priority vaccine groups, timely outreach, potential partners, new partners. This was in our 2017 preparedness um, guidance. So I think there has been, we've been through a lot of different exercises trying to anticipate something that is here today. We are in the thick of it. So we should also use some of these resources where a tremendous amount of work has gone on to think this through. Uh, we're doing a lot with, uh, with DFID, with the UK uh, Foreign Office, on uh, risk assessment, because ultimately the key uh, mission of the Vaccine Confidence Project is to be anticipating issues, to try to get ahead of things, to try to kind of anticipate and mitigate risk. And we have a mechanism, we're doing a very um, in-depth project in, uh, with this uh, approach in Nigeria, and we'll be then rolling it out for other countries. And just my last couple slides, um, just a, a, which has already been talked about, this knock-on effect um, that, you know, while all hands, eyes are focused on COVID, we do have this multiplicity of other health issues that haven't gotten the attention they need and are at risk. Um, so, and that can also help us bring some, even getting the basic childhood vaccines back on track. It can help people get some sense of uh, normal in the in an otherwise hyper uncertain environment and want to minimize the impact of COVID, get a flu shot. If nothing else, it's something familiar, it's something normal, and it's something that people feel like they can do, which in the context of COVID has been hugely frustrating for many people. This is the book that Valentina mentioned. It's uh, reflecting on the last 20 years of stories and experiences I've learned around uh, what drives people's thinking and, and behavior around vaccines. Um, and this is our website where we have this uh, archived, uh, including all the work on Ebola and other, and other outbreak and crisis management. Thanks very much.